Uh, as Jens mentioned, my name is Connor Hookstra. And in today's talk, we're going to be taking a look at C++ concepts and comparing them to adjacent language features in other programming languages. So um, we're going to be taking a look at Haskell type classes, Rust traits, uh, Swift protocols. And as a bonus, I also included, but this was post uh, my submission for this talk, uh, D type constraints. Um, so let's hop into it. Uh, first things first is all of these slides and code examples that are presented in this talk, you can find on my GitHub page in the talks repository under the meeting C++ uh, uh, 2020 uh, folder. And uh, the first thing I want to say is that uh, I'm not an expert, I'm just a dude. So this is a quote from Scott Scher, who uh, mentioned this in his CppCon 2015 talk. I'm not an expert, I'm just a dude. So if you've seen any of my other talks, you might have seen this uh, in my C++ uh, Now and P uh, CppCon 2019 algorithm intuition talk. Uh, this applies even more here because I am not a Rust, Swift, Haskell, or D developer. Uh, I primarily am a C++ developer. So if you are watching this online in the future and you are from one of those languages and I make a mistake, please let me know. But uh, no, uh, I learned most of uh, what I'm presenting in this talk about the other languages in the last couple months. So about me, uh, I'm a senior library software engineer working for NVIDIA. Specifically, I work on the Rapids AI team. Uh, this is an awesome team. We're completely open source and we're working on putting uh, the data science pipeline end to end on GPUs. So if you're familiar with the uh, Python pandas library, basically we're taking uh, that library and some other uh, machine learning libraries and putting them on the GPU. So if you're interested, check that out. Um, every month, I think we're hitting new uh, record breaking download numbers um, for us, that is. So it's a super exciting uh, library to be working on. I'm a programming language enthusiast. Uh, so at any given time, I'm learning uh, a number of languages. Uh, I love algorithms and beautiful code. Uh, I'm the organizer of the programming languages virtual meetup. Um, you can find details for that on my GitHub as well. And I have a YouTube channel. And uh, additionally, I'm excited to, to announce uh, that in the next coming weeks, I will be starting a podcast uh, with Bryce Adelstein Lelbach. Um, so we have the domain registered uh, and we have a Twitter account set up, um, but we have yet to record our first episode, but that'll be happening this month. Um, so if you're interested, uh, by the time this goes online, the recording of this video, uh, we should have our first episode up. It's going to be called the Algorithm uh, Plus Data Structures Equals uh, Program Podcast, otherwise known as ADSP, the podcast. And uh, you can follow us on Twitter right now if you want. And this photo was taken of Bryce and I almost exactly one year ago on November 10th, 2019. Uh, this was taken in Dublin in between the ISO Belfast meeting and I believe the fall ACCU uh, conference. So. Um, Really looking forward uh, to doing this with Bryce. So check it out if you're interested. On to the talk. The first thing I want to say about the talk is that this is not a language war talk. Um, although we, I will be comparing languages, uh, this is not like which which programming language is uh, better than uh, the other programming language. So not a programming uh, language war talk. If you've seen any of my other uh, talks or tweets, you'll know that I love all programming languages. I highlighted this last year at Meeting C++ 2019 in a lightning talk that I gave called uh, Consistently Inconsistent, uh, where I looked at a number of different programming languages. And I, I pointed out that we should all be kinder uh, to our other programming language sort of developer, uh, quote unquote, nemesis. Um, we can learn uh, a ton from other programming languages. And uh, I, I, I really like um, programming languages. So just know if I say anything bad about Rust or Swift or Haskell or D, uh, it's not because I don't like the language. It's just a comparison. Um, also, too, this was recently from the PLDI 2020 Programming Language Design and Implementation Conference. Uh, Guy, Guy Steele, who's one of my uh, heroes, um, he said in an AMA that uh, he loves all programming languages, too. So I think this is just absolutely fantastic. So once again, uh, this is not a language war talk. It's a language comparison talk. And furthermore, um, this is part one of part two. Um, and it's actually uh, reduced. So I give a practice version of this talk, and it went 90 minutes. So I've had to cut out about 20% of the content. In the future, I hope to give an extended version. Um, but know that this is supposed to be an introduction to these uh, language features. This is not supposed to go into the details about you know, which ones. It's no, there's no performance analysis. There's no compile time analysis. This is introducing you to the language features. Um, how do you use them? How do you write a simple one? 
and um, what do they look like um, when you compare them side by side. So with that out of the way, let's take a look at our agenda. So uh, the first section, which is about uh, one third of the talk, is an introductory in, or introduction slash history um, to sort of what I learned about these different languages and sort of how I came to give this talk. After that, there'll be a short section on generics and parametric polymorphism. Then we're gonna look at two examples. The first one is pretty simple. The second one is a little bit more involved, but still pretty simple. And at the end, I'll give uh, my final thoughts on um, these different language facilities. So introduction. The start of the path to this talk um, happened in 2018 when I started learning, learning Haskell. Um, so this is while I was at Amazon, there was a study group and um, a few of my coworkers wanted to learn functional programming. So uh, we started working our way through uh, this introduction to functional programming, a free online EDX course or edX course uh, that's taught by Eric Meyer, who's a pretty well-known individual in the programming language community. It was fantastic, but at a certain point we found that we wanted sort of a better textbook that was then was recommended in the course. So we started reading real world Haskell. And, uh, if you've read this book, you'll know that um, chapter six focuses on something called type classes. And at the time I was aware in 2018 that C++ 20 uh, was going to be getting concepts, um, but I didn't know much about them. And uh, learning about type classes, um, a sort of a little you know light bulb went off in my head that these might be somewhat similar uh, to C++ 20 concepts that we were gonna get in the future. But that I didn't really think much uh, more of it at the time. I just sort of made a mental note of it. Um, then. Roughly uh, a year later, I listened to a WWDC talk um, entitled Protocol Oriented Programming in Swift. Um, and this talk was given by Dave Abrahams. Uh, for those of you uh, that have been in the C++ community for a while, you might recognize that name. Um, and we're gonna take a look at a clip uh, from this talk. Of course, I'm talking about protocols. Protocols have all these advantages. And that's why when we made Swift, we made the first protocol-oriented programming language. So a little bit of an awkward clap there, but uh, this was a, um, a very, very highly reviewed talk. I think it's ranked as like the second best WWDC talk on certain top 10 languages or top 10 sort of videos from WWDC. Uh, I have to be honest, at the time, I didn't know much about Swift, and I was just watching it because Dave was giving the talk, and I'd seen a couple of his other talks. He's given talks on algorithms before. Um, but I thought it was an interesting talk, and it seemed like they were making some pretty cool claims about um, this new sort of protocol-oriented uh, programming paradigm that they were introducing. Um, then, just over one month later, so this is at the end of 2019, then in January of 2020, so this is this year now, um, I was listening to a podcast called Magic Read-Along, uh, where the two co-hosts uh, said the following. I just watched a video today on um, Swift and it's uh, and like their protocol driven development or protocol orient oriented development. And they, yeah, <laughs> no, it's pop, I guess okay. it was pro protocol oriented pop programming. And uh, they just basically introduced type classes, and they were like, "We invented this. This is amazing." <laughs> is, is it actual type classes, or is it just like uh, interfaces? It's it's interfaces that you can extend uh, ad hoc on on the fly. Like it's a, and basically you can have as many constraints as you want. It's basically type classes. Um, so I posted the like 1988 Wadler paper. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so uh, this was uh, pretty amazing. I thought that just one month previously, I had been watching this talk and then they were mentioning that type classes were basically what protocols were in Swift. Um, so I thought this was, this was just awesome. Uh, and then I went and looked up the 1988 paper, which I think I had read previously. It's a pretty famous paper where uh, Philip Wadler, who's also very well known, uh, he's known as Lambda Man in some circles, if you've watched any of his talks, uh, this paper introduces type classes, um, which is sort of, uh, not the first uh, you know, time this has been presented. It was presented in, I think, uh, Miranda and uh, Standard ML, and then even going back to Clue from before. Uh, but this is the paper that popularized it and led to it um, sort of entering into Haskell. Um, so we'll come back to this paper in a bit. Um, and, and finally, uh, on this introduction sort of path, four days later from uh, January 9th of 2020, I was on Reddit. And I stumbled across uh, the following post, which says, influence of C++ on Swift. 
Um, and this links to a question on Quora. Um, and we're going to go on a small digression very quickly because we have a lot to get through. Uh, but what is the question on Quora? So it states, what are the similarities and differences between C++ and Swift? Uh, if I had time, I'd ask, who do you thought answered this question? But I don't. Um, so I'm just going to tell you. The person that has the top answer to this question is David Vandervoot, um, who, as it says in his sort of byline, is on the C++ committee and is one of the five members of the direction group. He's also uh, the well-known author of the C++ templates book that uh, your previous speaker, Nikolai Yazoudis, is also a co-author of. Um, and Doug Greger, his name is going to come up later in the talk, and he's the th third co-author. So if we take a look at what David said, uh, we're not going to read all of it, but we'll highlight some things. So he says, remember that the original designer of Swift was Chris Latner, who started and led the LLVM project. LLVM is written in C++, and the Clang C++ compiler is one of the primary drivers for its continued development. When it came time to select a lead Swift compiler engineer and lead Swift standard library designer, who did Apple turn to? Doug Greger for the compiler and Dave Abrahams for the library. Both were some of the main contributors to the, to the C++11 standard and widely recognized as world-class C++ experts. Uh, so you can see uh, Chris Latner at the top there and then Doug Greger and Dave Abrahams. Um, so pretty interesting, or at least I find this sort of programming language history uh, interesting. And also interesting at the very bottom, it says, uh, all that to say that Swift was tremendously influenced by C++. However, Apple does not acknowledge this. I've been told that it is because more senior Apple decision makers dislike C++ at a personal level, in part because of the bitter rivalry between C++ and Objective-C in the 1980s. Um, so uh, that's pretty interesting to note that um, Swift, I guess, due to management, doesn't like to acknowledge it. Um, but I've watched a lot of LLVM talks, and um, a lot of the folks that are working on Swift um, even if they're not, I guess, the management, they do widely acknowledge that they borrow from many languages, including C++. Um, last note about uh, sort of these folks. So we have Chris Latner, then Doug Greger, and Dave Abrahams. Um, Doug Greger and Dave Abrahams, this was before my time sort of joining the C++ community, um, were uh, very, very involved in C++, as the post sort of mentions. Uh, so much so that this photo of Dave Abrahams is actually of him standing right next to John Kolb at uh, C++ Now, I believe 2016. And John Kolb, I assume most of you are familiar with, uh, but for those of you that aren't, he's the organizer of uh, CppCon, C++ Now, and he's the co-host and creator of CPP Chat. So um, pretty interesting uh, to know all this sort of trivia. Um, and that is the end of this digression. So back to the Reddit post, which is where we started our digression, that was uh, a post about the influence of C++ on Swift. And the main thing I want to point out here is uh, two comments uh, or two parts of comments that were in the Reddit thread. So the first thing, it's just the following, where uh, Mr. Mobster says, Swift protocols and Rust traits are very similar. Um, so I'm not a Rust programmer. I think everyone in Rust sort of is, uh, is knows that uh, traits are very similar to type classes and protocols, but this was the first time that I was sort of hearing about it. Uh, furthermore, um, in the next post, uh, Mr. Mobster says, this is why I am saving, uh, saying that Swift protocols are more similar to Rust traits, and goes on to say, and then of course we have C++ concepts, which are very interesting as well. They are somewhat like traits and protocols. Um, so this was sort of the point on January 13th of uh, this year, 2020, that I decided that I'm gonna give a talk at some point uh, comparing and learning about these uh, sort of traits, protocols, type classes, concepts, and then later on DE type constraints um, to see how they compare. Um, and then in the preparation for this talk, I found a number of other resources and videos that sort of talked about the relationship between these. So the first one is a clip from a YouTube video by an individual that goes by Context Free Online, uh, where he says the following. TypeScript structural interfaces, nor on Go interfaces, nor on Rust traits, nor on Swift protocols, nor on Haskell type classes, nor on standard ML modules. Instead, I'm going to talk about C++ 20 concepts. The next time uh, I heard sort of comparisons happening was in an LLVM 2017 talk uh, where one of the presenters was John McCall. So Swift has a very powerful generic system, uh, a very powerful system of constrained generics, and those are expressed by what we call protocols. Protocols are a lot like features that you see in other languages with first-class generic features, such as uh, signatures in standard ML or type classes in Haskell. And if you've been following uh, C++ London's meetup, they recently did two different uh, joint uh, sessions with Rust and C++. And in two of those talks, um, they both referred to how concepts are similar to Rust traits. So we're not going to watch that, but uh, this talk by Pias, our graphs harden Rust mentions it. And then a friendly introduction to Rust by Hendrik uh, also mentions it. And then in the most recent Rust uh, slash uh, C++ London meetup, uh, James Munns uh, refers to a talk uh, here. 
there's a really wonderful talk by Marin um, at Rust Fest in 2016 where he goes over the Rust that could have been. And so let's take a look at that talk. And then at some point, um, we got more Haskell people on the team and we all started agitating for uh, a type class kind of implementation uh, interface thing that we ended up now. So what Marin's talking about there is uh, sort of refers to what I heard in another podcast, uh, Functional Geekery, uh, where the guest said the following, I've been referring to Rust as the love child between Haskell and C++. Uh, so potentially, this is how we should think of Rust, C++ plus Haskell, or C++ plus Haskell plus Hart. Um, but I think that's kind of interesting just to know like um, what languages have influenced other languages. Um, so the point of all these clips is that there are a number of languages that have language features that are similar to the five that we are going to be looking at today. Uh, the five that we're looking at are concepts from C++, uh, traits from Rust, protocols from Swift, type classes from Haskell, and type constraints from D. But know that these were influenced uh, by other languages, and um, languages have other features that are under different names, like interfaces, et cetera. Um, but we're going to be taking a look at these five that are highlighted. So moving on to the second section, uh, generics and parametr parametric polymorphism. So at this point, we're going to hop back to the uh, 1988 uh, Philip Wadler paper. So in this paper, he introduces type classes. But in the introduction, he also defines uh, two different types of polymorphism. The first one is ad hoc polymorphism, and the second one is parametric polymorphism. So let's take a look at those two definitions. Uh, the first one is ad hoc polymorphism, which states, ad hoc polymorphism occurs when a function is defined over several different types, acting in a different way for each type. A typical example is overloaded multiplication. The same symbol may be used to denote uh, multiplication for integers, such as 3 times 3, and multiplication for floating point values, as in 3.14 times 3.14. Um, so that's interesting to know that uh, we have sort of same name functions that have different behaviors based on the type. Um, Wather then goes on to define parametric polymorphism right below this. Uh, so parametric polymorphism occurs when a function is defined over a range of types acting in the same way for each type. Um, and the example they go on to show is length. So, and you, you can't see it because it's off screen, uh, but it says that uh, length on a list of floating point numbers versus a list of integers um, has the exact same behavior. Um, so there's this sort of uh, analog between the two definitions. Ad hoc polymorphism refers to uh, sort of same name functions with different behavior based on different types, whereas parametric polymorphism um, uh, leads to having same name functions uh, with different types, but the same behavior. So why is this important? Um, C++ sort of has support for parametric uh, polymorphism, at least superficially through its uh, templates facility. Um, but like, why is this important? And I didn't really truly appreciate um, that I, I, I love parametric polymorphism and templates, but I didn't truly appreciate it until I uh, learned Go. And um, before we take a look at this example, let's uh, take a look at what Kevlin Henney, one of my favorite speakers, has to say about Go. Now, here's an interesting one. So this is Go. Um, which has been described as a very opinionated language uh, in terms of its style and its design decisions, uh, many of which I find incredibly easy to disagree with. So interesting for uh, Kevlin Henney to say that. Um, I think Go is a very interesting language, uh, but I definitely agree that it is super opinionated. Um, but back to the example, um, this piece of code uh, does not compile. And I'll pause for a second um, for you to try and figure out why that is. Uh, but as there's a bit of a leg and I'm short, I have a lot to cover, um, I'm not going to ask the audience. I'll just give you a couple seconds. And by now, some of you might have figured it out. It's because the math.min uh, function uh, only works for floats. So Go famously does not have support for parametric polymorphism. Um, and that is super irritating, in my opinion, because in order to get this piece of code to work, uh, for integers, that is, like without changing a and b to floats, uh, you have to cast a to a float 64, then b to a float 64, get back a float 64 from math.min, and then cast that back to an int if you want it to be an int. Um, so parametric polymorphism uh, or any facility that superficially gives you support for that um, is something that I really, really uh, desire in the programming language that I'm working in. Um, just a note, so this used to be a video clip. I'm not going to play it. Like I said, I'm, I'm short on time. Um, but uh, Philip Wadler, uh, the individual I mentioned earlier from the 1988 Type Classes paper, um, Rob Pike, that one of the designers of Go, has reached out to Phil and asked him to help add uh, parametric polymorphism to Go 2.0. So if you're a Go developer, 
uh, and you are hoping that uh, parametric polymorphism gets into Go, that might be coming in the future. Um, so uh, parametric polymorphism uh, is really important in my opinion. Um, and one last thing while we're in this sort of uh, generics and parametric polymorphism um, brief uh, overview is this paper uh, that was written for uh, introducing or uh, suggesting an introduction of lightweight parametric polymorphism, polymorphism for Oberon, uh, which is a language um, uh, created, I believe, by Nicholas Wirth, who was mo more popular for uh, Pascal, Pascal and Modula um, 1, 2, and 3. Um, the reason I'm highlighting this paper is because there's a fantastic quote um, that I've heard from someone that I can't remember, um, but the quote is the following. Uh, we introduce parametric polymorphism via our previous example. A type may be parameterized on types in much the same way as a pr procedure may be parameterized on values. And this is my mental model for what concepts and adjacent uh, language features similar to concepts are. Um, you can think of uh, type constraints or concepts or insert whatever you call it in your language as um, the way that types are to values. So types define the set of values uh, that uh, integer or a floating point can assume. So when you have an integer, it can be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. When you have a floating point, you can have numbers with fractional um, parts. Um, so a type defines sort of the set of values uh, that the type uh, can, you know, the values can assume. Uh, a type constraint does the same thing for types, um, or a type class, or a, a concept. You're basically uh, defining the set of values that your type can take. Um, and I've been told that this mental model is wrong. Uh, but I think that's totally okay because I heard once before that all models are wrong, but some are useful, and I find this mental model uh, very useful. Um, so that takes us through the first two sections of sort of introducing us to, uh, you know, how did I get to giving this talk? Um, what is parametric polymorphism? And uh, now we're going to take a look at our first example. So uh, we've gotten through about half of our slides, and we're going to slow down and take a look at code now. Um, which I think is sort of where you're going to learn uh, what concepts look like and all the other protocols, traits, type classes, and uh, type constraints. So um, our first example is the following. We are going to add two integers. Pretty simple. Um, but I think it's quite illustrative to look at uh, taking a non-generic function and making it generic and what that looks like in these five uh, different languages. So in C++, we have the following. Uh, hopefully, everybody that's watching this, either live or online uh, on YouTube in the future, um, is familiar with this syntax. So here we're using trailing return type. That's maybe the only thing that might be um, somewhat surprising to certain individuals. But otherwise, we're taking uh, two integers, a and b, and then just returning them. Um, so we're going to move this code a little bit around and then take a look at what the uh, same code looks like in D, Rust, Swift, and Haskell. So in D, uh, we have the following. Um, it is almost exactly identical to the C++ solution and could be exactly identical if I wasn't using trailing return type in the C++ solution. Um, the only difference here being that D does not support trailing return type. So you have to put the uh, return type uh, before the function name, um, which is fine. Um, Rust uh, looks slightly different. So here uh, they have a keyword uh, fun uh, for sort of declaring that you're uh, declaring a function. Uh, then we have uh, a colon, b colon um, for our arguments to our function, um, i32 instead of int, and then uh, trailing return type uh, plus just a plus b. Um, so note that there's no semicolon here and no return. Uh, Rust does have semicolons and returns uh, a return keyword. But um, for functions in Rust, you can omit the semicolon and the return if the last expression is what you're returning. Um, and that's pretty idiomatic to do in Rust. Um, Swift looks pretty similar, um, except that instead of uh, fun, we have func, so two extra characters. Um, and we have uh, ints with a capital I instead of I32. Um, and then we have sort of the underbar, which is for uh, argument names. I won't get into that. It's just something that Swift supports. You can omit those in uh, Swift 5.3. Uh, but on the online playground that I was using, 5.1, you still have to um, put the underbar, underbar there. Um, and note that uh, trailing return type and A plus B as well, you can omit the return and the semicolon. And uh, last but not least is uh, Haskell, uh, one of my favorite languages. Um, this is going to look extremely different um, if you're not familiar uh, with Haskell. Um, here, we don't have any keyword to define 
uh, that we're creating a function because everything in Haskell basically is a function. Um, and the way you can think of the, the first line is that after the double colon, the first two integers are the uh, arguments to our function. And the last one is our output. This isn't actually what's happening, but in terms of coming from C++ and trying to understand the type signature, that's the way you can think about it. Um, and then A and B are sort of the names for our arguments, and then we're just adding them together. Um, so uh, to sort of summarize the differences between all of the following five, uh, we can put them at the top, uh, reorient them so, so we, we sort of align the function names, the trailing return types, and the bodies of the function, except for Haskell, because it's so uh, different to the other four. Um, and then we can summarize the differences here. So keyword before the function, uh, I posted this or something similar to this that we're going to look at in a second on Twitter. And then I got a bunch of comments saying, oh, auto is how you make a function. Uh, I can use auto for variables. I can use auto, et cetera, et cetera. My point here is that uh, if you want to use trailing return type, the keyword that goes before your function is auto. Um, for D, it's the type. For Rust, it's fun. For Swift, it's funk. And for uh, Haskell, uh, it doesn't have one. Uh, what are integers called, or at least for 32-bit integers in C++, it's int or int32 underscore t. Uh, D is int, Rust is i32, and Swift and Haskell are uh, int capital I. Uh, trailing return type, the only language that doesn't support it is D. And is the return necessary only in uh, C++ and uh, D? The other three, it is not. So as I mentioned, we're going to go on a small digression here and look at uh, way more languages than just these five when it comes to the keyword uh, before uh, a function name. Um, so note that this isn't entirely accurate. Um, for closure, technically, dfun is a macro. Um, certain, some languages have uh, two keywords that you can use for functions. So we'll zoom in and take a closer look. Um, the top one is def uh, from the following languages. I think the most interesting language here is Crystal. For those of you that have, haven't heard of Crystal, Crystal is basically uh, Ruby plus C. It's basically designed to have the syntax of Ruby and the speed of C, and it's a statically compiled Ruby. So if you know anything about Ruby, it's a dynamically, uh, I don't think it's compiled, interpreted language. Um, but so Crystal is just supposed to be a fast, uh, a fast Ruby, basically, with the speed of C. Um, note that Fortran also has another keyword called subroutine, I believe. Um, but yeah, pretty interesting. If we scroll down, uh, we can see that functions, the, the next most popular, then func. Uh, which Go, Nim, and Swift have. Nim is an interesting language, um, and it has two keywords as well. Proc is the other one, and func actually is a keyword uh, for defining functions without side effects. So Nim is like a low-level language, similar um, to uh, other languages like Zig and Crystal, and uh, neat that they have a keyword for side effect-free functions. I wish more languages had that kind of thing. Um, then after func, we have fun, which exists in Rust and Zig, and then at the bottom we have um, the languages that are sort of one-offs. Fun is for Kotlin, which I think is a, I think that's a nice keyword. If I wrote a language, I might choose fun. End of our digression, and uh, back to our uh, functions that add to integers. So what we're going to do now is we are going to take these non-generic functions and make them generic uh, one by one. Uh, so in C++, probably most of you know how to do this, um, and that's by adding a template. So uh, you get rid of the explicit ints, and you write template angle type name t angle, and then you replace each of the ints with a t, and you now have a generic function. Uh, pretty cool. In D, it's something very similar. Uh, we are going to, instead of adding uh, angles and a couple new keywords, we're just going to, oh, I skipped ahead. So uh, in C++20, we actually have the ability now to omit the template uh, and the type name and just explicitly put autos in here. And I think this is super nice. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to become like against best practice. Uh, only time will tell. Um, but uh, I think this is really, really cool. And it's, I think, more general than any of the other languages. Uh, D does something similar, um, but minus two keywords. So it instead of using angles, uses extra parentheses after add. So uh, the first set of parentheses now that contains the T um, is for uh, the template type. And then once again, you just replace int, int, int with TTT, and uh, we're good to go here. Uh, for Rust, we have to do the following. So add um, angle T, angle, and then replace each of the ints uh, with a T. So you're starting to see a pattern here. Uh, for Swift, we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to replace uh, each of the ints with a T, and then put angle T, angle in front of our parentheses. 
And Haskell is maybe one of the more interesting ones. You just replace each of the ints uh, with a lowercase letter. Um, typically, idiomatically, you would use A here, but in order to be uh, you know, symmetric to the other examples, I'm using T. Um, however, not all of these pieces of code work. Um, and I'll pause. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll ask and see how far uh, people are behind. Um, does anybody know which ones don't work? I've paused, but I don't see the chat updating. So I think there's a bit of a lag. So the answer to the question uh, for the ones that do work are the first two, C++ and D. All of the other uh, functions don't work. Um, and this is because the model uh, of that generics uses uh, is almost the opposite from a certain perspective. Um, so for Rust, in order to get this to work, we have to specify something that lets uh, the compiler know that A and B are addable. Um, so the way that you do that is by adding the following, uh, basically adding a quote unquote constraint on type T that says T is addable. Uh, for Swift, we do something very similar. Um, we call this uh, T numeric, and anything that's numeric can be added. And uh, for Haskell, we are going to do uh, something very similar to Swift and Rust as well by adding a type class that lets us know that uh, T is numeric as well. Um, and this is one of, I think, the most important points of this talk that I want to get across to the watchers and listeners. Um, it is that amongst these language features, there are two categories. Um, the categories uh, names that I'm choosing are type constraints versus type classes. So like, note, obviously, type classes are what Haskell call, calls their language feature. Uh, Rust has traits. Swift has protocols. Um, but I, I think that this is, at least this is the way that I think about it. So type constraints are the language features that actually constrain. You're starting with the world and then restricting what you can do with your types. Um, so in the previous five uh, examples that we looked at, you know, C++ and D, you didn't need to let the compiler know anything about your generic type T. You could just go ahead, write the code, and it would work. Uh, but for Haskell, Rust, and Swift, just writing a generic type T um, doesn't, doesn't let you do anything with it. Um, you have to let the compiler know, and therefore, like, give consent to uh, add to your two generic types um, A and B, which both are the same in this example T, but in other examples, they could be something else. Um, and to highlight this even further, let's take a look at a function that takes a generic type T and returns a generic type T. Um, so we'll take a look at C++ and Haskell. Um, and this is the how you would write those functions in each of the languages. So for C++, we have template type name T, uh, a function F that takes a single argument T and returns a T. And Haskell um, is the same thing here. It's a lot more uh, terse, though. We have our function F that takes a single T and returns a single T. Um, and the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that C++, with this function, we can, we can do anything. Um, the way you write it, it might not end up compiling, um, but we don't need to do anything more uh, to T um, in order to write whatever function that you want to write. Uh, whereas with Haskell, it's the exact opposite. We can do exactly one thing with this function, and that's just return the T that we got. Because we don't, we don't know how to do. We don't know if we can compare t to something. We don't know if we can add t to something. We don't know anything about t, um, and and this is like it's completely opposite. Uh, and uh, interestingly, there's a name for this function. I'm sure anyone that's a functional programmer uh, or has spent some time with functional programming languages knows the name of it. It is uh, ID in Haskell, which stands for identity. And interesting note, in C++20, we're getting a function object in the functional header um, called uh, identity that does the exact same thing. This might seem useless, but it actually comes in handy uh, many times um, if you start doing sort of functional programming things. Um, but I'm not going to jump into that because we still have quite a few slides to get through. So um, I think this is really interesting. Like once I sort of observed that this was the differing behaviors between uh, type constraints and type classes, 
because of the way that the type class category refers to their generics. Um, if you recall earlier from the LLVM 2017 talk when uh, John McCall, who is, I believe, the main implementer of generics in Swift, um, this was the start of that video clip. They refer to their generics that use protocols as constrained generics. Um, and an unconstrained generic is one that you can't do anything with, um, which I find completely counterintuitive. I had someone recently try to explain that potentially you're constraining uh, what your type can be and therefore increasing uh, the possible things that you can do with your type. Um, but that, I still think that's counterintuitive because you're sort of jumping through a mental hoop in order to make sense of the way that you're speaking about something. From like the C++ perspective, you actually, you are constraining. Like it is, uh, a concept is a constraint on your generic type. You're limiting what you can um, pass into a generic function when you put a concept on it, where it's the opposite in other languages. Um, furthermore, in the same presentation, uh, or I think it was even earlier, um, it refers to uh, the parametric polymorphism that Swift has as bounded parametric polymorphism. Um, so this is why I sort of, I split this talk into two talks. This one's just an introduction, but I started going through the literature and um, in the literature, it seems like there's zero agreement on what they refer to this kind of parametric polymorphism that has constraints or has bounds. Um, some of the papers refer to it as bounded parametric polymorphism. Some of them refer to it as uh, constrained parametric polymorphism. Um, other papers uh, come up with sort of uh, different names that I think refer to what I'm sort of referring to as type constraints versus type classes as like nominal and structural. Um, but these were like, you know, 30 to 80 page papers that I did not have the time to like fully digest and understand. Um, so just note that there are subcategories of parametric polymorphism and uh, the naming, at least to me, is a little bit counterintuitive. Um, but as long as you have the mental model um, to keep things this way where you've got type constraints that are actually constraining the generic type such that it's limiting what you can pass to the function versus type classes, which you start with the generic function and then have to add constraints in order to give your uh, function the ability to do something with the generic type. Um, and that's the point that I'm trying to drive across with this example. Um, so this brings us to our last example, which is a little bit more involved. Um, and this is uh, looking at uh, shapes. So specifically, we're gonna implement uh, objects, classes, um, a circle and a rectangle, and then we're gonna write a non-generic print shape uh, info function, and then we're gonna make that, uh, we're gonna constrain that non-generic function by first making it generic, and then adding either a concept or a trait or a protocol um, or a type class or a type constraint to each of these uh, now generic functions, and we're gonna write that uh, concept or insert language feature ourselves to see what that looks like. So first we're gonna start off with C++, and this is what our uh, circle class and rectangle class look like in uh, C++. Um, so this, uh, I have mixed feelings about. Um, note here that we've got uh, for our circle, a single member variable R, which stands for radius, and uh, in rectangle, we have uh, two variables, W and H for width and height. I'm just shortening them because it's slideware. So if you're unhappy with the formatting or anything on uh, the slides, note this is just slideware. Um, to try and uh, make this all fit. And um, we've got three methods, name, area, and parameter. All of these are non-modifying methods. So in C++, in order to make that happen, or to ensure that that's the case, we have to put const after each of these um, using trailing return type. And probably the coolest thing, in my opinion, about this code is that it's making use of C++20 uh, constants with the use of uh, pi in our two area and perimeter um, functions. So um, nothing too exciting here if you're a veteran C++ developer. Moving on to the uh, D version of this code. So very similar, uh, we've switched to a Pascal case for our uh, class names, because that's idiomatic in D. Um, the main difference here is that our constructor doesn't have the same name as our class. It now has the name this. Um, and uh, we have no trailing return type. Um, everything else is almost identical, um, including that we have to add const after our method in order to make it um, uh, non-modifying, and I think that's a mistake. D had the opportunity to get the default right there, and um, yeah, it's unfortunate that they they copied C++ when it came to that. Um, moving on to our Rust example, uh, this is going to be starting to look a little bit different than what we've seen, but still, um, still pretty parsable if you're a C++ developer. 
so note that in your struct circle and rectangle, you define the members. And then for your member functions, uh, you define them in an impulse scope. Uh, so here we've got our name, area, and perimeter methods. Uh, trailing return type as well, F32, similar to the I32 for our floating point number. Uh, a big difference here is that uh, for our, our string literals, you have to call the dot to string method in order to uh, get this to compile. And we've also got some extra selfs. Um, but note that you don't see const anywhere. One, I don't believe Rust has the const keyword. Um, they have the opposite of const, which is mut. Um, so by default, everything is const. So uh, these methods are by default non-modifiable. And I think that's a fantastic language decision. Um, if you want them to be modifiable, you have to add a mut in front of the self that you're passing uh, to each of these methods. Um, moving on to the Swift example, which is uh, very similar to the Rust. Um, once again, uh, they made the correct, in my opinion, language decision of making by default uh, methods of classes non-modifying. In order to make the name area perimeter modifying, you have to add the mutable keyword. Um, other than that, though, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Note that their constructor is called uh, init. Um, and uh, we have trailing return type as well here. And I think it's pretty straightforward. Honestly, I found Swift. I make this um, point at the end of the talk, but Swift as a C++ developer, you can basically just like guess your way to programming the correct thing. Um, I found uh, Swift an extremely pleasant language uh, to, to code in because um, of several reasons that I'll talk about at the end. But yeah, it was very easy writing this up. Last but not least, we have Haskell. So Haskell is going to look obviously the most different. Here I'm using, uh, I believe, record syntax and then just uh, six free functions. Um, Note that uh, this actually doesn't work because I use the uh, what looks like function overloading that doesn't actually exist in Haskell. Um, so the functions name, area, and perimeter um, have to be named differently in order for this code to compile. So unfortunately, I have to name these circle name, circle area, circle perimeter, um, and then uh, the same thing for rectangle. Note this isn't the best way to do this. There are you know probably 10 different ways you can write this code. The reason I'm writing it this way is so that it lends itself to converting it to the type class code that we're going to see in a few slides here. Uh, so know that you know obviously this isn't very elegant code. I'm just setting up the transition uh, to the type class code in the future. Um, and so now let's go back to C, and we're going to look at the generic print uh, shape info functions uh, for each of these uh, examples. So we're starting off with C++. So here, back to snake case, because that's idiomatic in C++. We have print shape info and using the auto keyword instead of the template type name with C++20. And uh, although the compilers and uh, library devs haven't implemented uh, standard format yet, you can still use it on Godbolt. So I'm using um, format to just get ready, because it's coming. And uh, this is pretty straightforward. So this, this works. If you call this on both uh, our rectangle and circle class, this will compile and work, and that's fantastic. Um, moving on to the D example, uh, we have print shape info now in camel case uh, because it's a function. And uh, this looks slightly different, um, but it's pretty straightforward and similar to what we saw in the adding integer example. So we're using these parentheses to declare our uh, generic type T, and then um, just calling name, area, and perimeter similar to what we did in the C++ example. And oh, similar to C++, this also works due to the fact that we are in the type constraint model. And so we have no constraints. Therefore, it works with everything that compiles, um, which, is, which is nice. Uh, and now we're going to move to the three languages that don't currently work. So uh, print shape info, um, back to snake case here. Interestingly, the compiler will actually uh, like whine at you if you don't do this in snake case. If you do it in, which is what I did. Initially, I did it in camel case. And then the compiler said, it's not idiomatic. Uh, please switch to snake case. Um, anyways, we have our angle t angle uh, for our generic type t. Um, however, this isn't constrained at this point in time. Um, so if you try to compile this, you're going to get the following. Um, name method not found in t. Um, and so uh, we're going to have to fix this by setting up a trait. And we're going to do that in a second. Um, Note that uh, I had a digression about this that I had to take out, but I'll, I just still want to briefly mention the compiler messages in Rust are mind-blowingly helpful. Um, it's, it reads here, items from traits can only be used if the type parameter is bounded by the trait. The following trait defines an item name. Perhaps you need to restrict the type uh, parameter t with it. And then it gives you a suggestion for the exact trait that you need to use in order to get this to compile. 
And in my digression, I showed like four other examples where the compiler just tells you exactly what you need in order to get the code to compile. And as someone exploring the language, that is like, it's an amazing story and an amazing experience. So like kudos to the Rust compiler team. Uh, fantastic work there. Moving on to the Swift uh, print shape info. Um, here, this looks like almost identical to the D code. Um, but once again, similar to Rust, this is not going to compile because we need to constrain our generic in order to get this to work. Um, so if you try and compile this, you're going to get a uh, value of type T has no member name. Um, and moving on to the Haskell example, I could have written something here. Um, but the goal I was trying to show is like working your way towards a generic function that works. And um, going towards type classes doesn't really have a middle step. It's either going to work in Haskell or it isn't. Or it isn't. Um, so I left this slide out. Uh, but we are going to get this code working uh, when we circle back to this. So for the final time, we're going to go back to C++ and work our way through these examples once more uh, by adding the code that we need for concepts, uh, type constraints, uh, protocols, traits, and type classes. So we're back in C++. We have our currently compiling print shape info uh, generic function. But now we want to constrain this. So we're going to write a concept. So this is what that's going to look like. Um, the first thing that we need to do is to declare a string concept, because we need to have a concept uh, for the return type of our name function. And currently, um, the standard library doesn't provide you a string concept. Um, once we have that, we can define another concept shape. And uh, we do this by going template type 9s, concept shape equals requires, and then your parameter s, and then in braces, all of the requirements that you want for your concept. So for our concept, we want um, it to basically have three methods, name, area, and perimeter. And we want the return type for each of those to be string and a floating point number. Um, so this is pretty nice. Um, it, in my opinion, isn't as elegant as the other languages, but the other languages don't have 40 years of legacy. Um, so considering that C++ has 40 years of legacy, um, I think that this is pretty nice. Um, and once we have this concept, all we have to do is add shape in front of auto. And now we have a conceptified generic function or constrained generic function. Note that there are two or three, or maybe even four, different ways to write this. You can, um, in your template type name, replace type name with shape. And there's a couple of different ways to do it. Um, without there being best practice at the moment, this is my favorite way to do it. Uh, I think it looks the cleanest. Um, but note that there are other ways that you can get this uh, working. Um, with that, we're going to move on to the uh, D example. Uh, so for D, to write a type constraint, you have to do the following. Um, so it's a little bit noisy. We have uh, template shape, paren t paren, uh, then braces. And then inside that, uh, const, the name of our uh, type constraint shape, and then uh, double underbar our traits uh, with a bit of noise, compiles, comma, and then our generic type. And then once we have that, another set of braces and then inside here, we basically uh, set up the methods that we want our shape to have. Note, uh, I didn't spend time trying to figure out how to constrain the return type. So this one's a bit looser than what we just saw in C++ concepts, but it still does the trick. So this is going to be a cons or I should say type constraint shape um, that uh, is met. I just got a warning asking me if I would like to restart my computer. I'm going to say no. Um, and uh, it's going to any any class that has the name area or perimeter uh, method is going to conform to this. Um, and uh, similar to uh, what we did for C++ concepts, now that we have our type constraint, um, we just need to modify our function. It looks a little bit different. So here we're using uh, an if statement or expression, not exactly sure which one it is. Um, and then going shape, exclamation mark, and then uh, passing the generic that we are constraining here. And I actually like this quite a bit. Um, it's very, very readable, in my opinion. Um, like you need to know the C++ uh, concept syntax to parse that uh, a concept goes before auto in a parameter list. Um, this, though, even if you have no, no idea what um, D looks like, you might be able to make an educated guess of, of what uh, the if statement is doing here. Um, so now we're moving on to Rust. Um, I'm showing here the impl circle and rectangle because we're going to need to make adjustments to those lines of code in order to get this to work. Um, but for Rust, we're going to de uh, define a trait now. So trait um, has some pretty nice syntax, in, in my opinion. Uh, we go trait shape, uh, braces, and then uh, our three methods uh, that we want our trait um, to have. And note that if I go back one step, we also made a change where it said impl circle and impl rectangle before. It now says impl shape for circle and impl shape for rectangle. Um, 
And similar, once we have our trait now, all we need to do in order to get this to be a compiling uh, Rust piece of code is to add the colon shape on our generic type T in the angle brackets. And now we have uh, constraints or constrained our generic type T, and this uh, example will compile now. Um, so I think this is like really, really clean. Um, I really like the way that Rust has designed this. Uh, moving on to Swift, we have our uh, class rectangle and class circle once again, because we're going to need to make adjustments to these two lines of code. And uh, we have to implement a protocol now. So protocols, in my opinion, are probably the cleanest. Um, I'm not sure why, but the lack of semicolons just makes this look really, really nice, in my opinion. So it's almost identical to traits, though. Other than that, we've got protocol shape, and then our three methods, name, area, and perimeter, um, that return strings and uh, two floats. Um, and note that, once again, the change that we make to uh, rectangle and circle um, is that we're putting a colon shape after each of it. So this looks similar to what we know in C++'s inheritance. Note that these are not the same things. Um, and then, uh, once again, now that we have our protocol in Swift, all we need to do is add colon shape uh, to our generic type T in the angle brackets. And we now have a constrained generic function, which uh, enables this piece of code to compile. And uh, last but not least, we have our Haskell example. Um, so in Haskell, we have uh, our circle and rectangle methods, or um, circle and rectangle uh, records. And note that I've gone back to the uh, functions that uh, are named the same, and that because it leads to a better animation um, for the next slide, which is the following. Um, so now we have a type class shape at the top of the file that implements uh, name, area, and perimeter, or I, I should say has, doesn't implement. And uh, it comes with the function signatures for each of these. Um, and then uh, for the records, we don't have to change anything, so those look identical. And then we have two pieces of code, instance shape circle where and instance uh, shape rectangle where. And these are the implementations of the three methods or functions, I should say, uh, that adhere to our shape type class. Um, this is pretty nice in my opinion. Uh, note that there's a different way that you can write this uh, where you declare a sum type um, that is sort of either a circle or a rectangle. And then you can combine the two instance uh, shape for the uh, sum type instead of splitting these up. But uh, once again, just sort of to stay as closely symmetric to the other examples, this is the way that I'm showing it. Um, so that is a sort of whirlwind tour of the five different language features, C++ concepts, uh, D type constraints, Rust traits, Swift protocols, and Haskell type classes, um, how you use them, and how you can write uh, sort of the simplest versions of these in each of their corresponding languages. Um, and uh, if we want to, um, you might be thinking that this code uh, looks a little bit more verbose currently on the slide. That's because we actually have uh, a little bit of extra code compared to the other examples. So we can remove uh, the records and the uh, function implementations, and then it looks uh, more similar to uh, the previous examples that we had in the other four languages. And with roughly uh, five or six minutes left, this brings us to our conclusion. So final thoughts. Um, about just generally going through the process of writing these examples in each of the five languages. Um, they're sort of like fluffy uh, uh, things to, to think about, but um, they're things that you know impact um, how much I'm enjoying a language or not. Um, so the first thing is time to implement. Uh, surprisingly, C++ actually took me the longest, even though it's the one that I have the most experience in. Um, Swift was incredibly easy, like I said. Um, half the time I was just uh, writing the code and it worked. Um, D is very, very similar uh, to C++, but they had a lot more support for their type constraints. So in C++, probably one of the reasons I had, uh, it took longer is that I had to write the uh, string concept and the corresponding uh, is string trait, type trait. Um, those didn't exist, so I had to write them on my own, whereas every other language, I didn't have to worry about that. Um, and then Rust and Haskell were in uh, third and fourth. Haskell's got a pretty steep learning curve. and Typically, uh, to get code working, it takes a little bit longer. But once it is working, uh, you have a lot more guarantees that it is going to work. And you could probably say the same thing about Rust. Um, the other metric, or one of the other metrics that I, I measured was lines of code. Um, unsurprisingly, if you're familiar with Haskell code, Haskell was the shortest. Um, then Swift and Rust, uh, and then D and C++. C++ in last place, once again, probably because of the um, 
concepts for string and uh, is string type trait. Um, also, D and C++ had uh, imports and includes, which added to the line count. I did my best to you know, have uh, equal or fair comparison, but I'm sure you know, it's plus or minus like five lines. So take this with a grain of salt. Um, and the last thing that I sort of uh, ranked was uh, what I call pleasantness. Um, now, I don't want you to think that I didn't enjoy writing the C++ code. This is a relative comparison. Um, Swift was just an incredibly pleasant language to code in coming from C++. Um, like I said earlier, half the time, I just guessed right. I just wrote code, hit run, and it worked. Um, and I kept on like, oh, like th that worked on the first try without me having to even go to the docs. Like it's an amazing uh, experience. Uh, Chris Latner um, really focused on something that he wanted to be one of the values of Swift, which uh, I'm calling PDOC, which stands for Progressive Disclosure of Complexity. This has also been referred to um, making the language infinitely hackable, um, where you start off uh, having Swift feel like Python. So you can just go into the playground, type print hello world, exactly like you would in Python, and it works. Um, but as you want, you can uh, go and look at the more complicated parts of the language and turn off the automatic reference counting and, and get really into the weeds if you want. Um, but it's it progressively happens. So it starts off like Python, and it can end up feeling like a more complicated language like C or C++, um, but only if you want to. And I, I think uh, Chris Latner did a, a really good job with that. And uh, the defaults are all correct, in my opinion, at least the ones that I experienced, um, which is really, really nice. Rust uh, compiler messages were amazing, which made it a very pleasant experience. Um, and for this language, the defaults were also all correct, at least the ones that I ran into. Um, D was really similar to C++, but like I said, they have a lot more support for sort of generics um, and this kind of thing. So it was a little bit easier to, to get things working. Um, however, I think that they might have added a little bit too much complexity in some pl places. Like we have the const keyword. Um, they added a bunch, like immutable, et cetera. Um, and I'm not sure, I don't know enough about D, but I'm not sure that that was necessary and they, they might have made some mistakes there. Um, Haskell is a steep learning curve um, and the compiler messages are pretty bad, especially when you compare them to Rust. So even if Rust is the combination of Haskell and C++, um, definitely Rust did not adopt the bad compiler messages, which I'm very, very thankful for. And uh, C++ is at the bottom, but that's not because I think, like, like I said, I think the code um, for what C++ is looked potentially as good as it could look. But when you have 40 years of history, um, you're going to end up with less elegant code when you're starting from you know, scratch. Uh, I think Swift was introduced in 2014, and Rust uh, was started by Graydon Hoare in 2010, and then the Mozilla team picked up and really started rolling in 2012 to like 15. Uh, but both of these languages are less than a decade old. Like, so that's we're looking at like close to an order of magnitude of uh, tenure when compared to C++. Um, another thing about C++ is most of the defaults are wrong, uh, which is just it's just a legacy thing. You know, um, it's not the end of the world, but it would just be nice if I didn't have to write const all the time and I could just write mut uh, when I wanted something to be mutable. And the other thing is that C++ 20 is a work in progress. So um, the compilers don't all have full support for C++ 20. So potentially by the time a decade's gone by and we're using C++ 26, um, this is going to be, uh, a, it, you know, C++ could be at the top of this list. Um, probably not, but it should be a better story in uh, a little bit of time. Very quickly, um, on sort of the popularity of languages, there's a really cool website by Context Free from, we saw one of the videos earlier that ranks C++, uh, or here, C++, Swift, Rust, Haskell, and D are all ranked. You can see the number across all programming languages. So C++ is at 5, Swift 15, Rust 17, Haskell 33, and D 73. Um, it's uh, unfair because obviously C++ has been around for decades, but I just like, I think it's fun to look at these graphs. Um, you always have to take it with a grain of salt because they're based on things that, you know, aren't always entirely accurate. This one, I think, is an average of a bunch of other websites. So on the next slide, I have uh, other language rankings, TIOB, uh, PYPL, Redbunk, and Google Trends. Uh, so roughly, they're always in the same order. Um, Swift, surprisingly, um, ranks very, very highly. I think as someone that doesn't have an iPhone and a Mac um, and is outside of the Apple ecosystem, I underestimated the size of like the Swift community. Um, when you take a look at the uh, number of uh, followers on the subreddits, um, Swift falls behind Rust here. But I think that's because Swift is not the first place that um, Swift developers go. 
Uh, I think they go to Swift forums. I couldn't find a number for the number of developers there, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if that number, uh, especially when combined with uh, Reddit users, uh, was higher than the Rust one. And um, I think this metric is actually more telling than the other graphs because um, given that C++ has only been, or has been around for 40 years and, and Rust and Swift are so new, it's uh, amazing like how many people are, are on those uh, subreddits. Um, so once again, these are my final thoughts. Uh, I think all these languages have their sort of pros and cons. Um, but I think knowing sort of the different categories of type classes versus type constraints and um, sort of how the language defaults are different is, is really cool. And I hope that going through this or watching me go through this, um, you learned something and uh, you are now more excited about using C++ concepts in the future. I think it's going to be an amazing feature to be able to constrain your generic uh, parameters and make our compiler messages better and make our compile times less. Um, all of those things are awesome. So I'm super excited for C++ 20 concepts. Once again, all my slides are on uh, my GitHub under the talks repo. Um, just look for meeting C++ 2020. Um, all of the uh, podcasts, video links, papers, and other articles that I referred to in my talk and didn't refer to in, in my talk but used in preparing for this, uh, you can find in that repo if you're interested. And uh, with that, thank you. <laughs>